Good evening. So good to be here tonight to study more in God's Word and talk about uh, having a gentle answer as Christians. And we're going to continue in that study tonight. Just two more Wednesday nights left um, before we move into this class. This is my story. Uh, I think this sounds like an extremely exciting class. It's going to be a little different. It's not going to be taught by just one man. I think it's going to be taught by multiple, multiple men um, here in the Nashua family. So that's going to be really neat. And it's going to focus on lots of different stories in the Bible. Maybe some familiar, maybe not some familiar. Um, stories of men, stories of women too. I think this is going to be a really great class. And it's going to be on Sundays and um, offered on Wednesdays. So very, very excited about that class. Last week, we talked about how we are called to be gentle when facing criticism, even when criticism is fair or when criticism is unfair. Tonight, this is what we're going to talk about. We are called to forgive as Christ forgave. And that is such a big part of offering a gentle answer. But what does that really involve? Forgiving as Christ forgave. So that's what we're going to study about tonight. Let's begin with a prayer. God, we come before you so thankful that we can be here tonight, that we can open up our Bibles together and talk about your forgiveness and help us to think about the fact that we've been forgiven of so much and help that to guide our thoughts on how we should forgive others. In Jesus' name, amen. According to an article in 2019, a well-known preacher alleged, allegedly sought the services of a hitman on two separate occasions. <clears throat> the first alleged target was a critic of his ministry, and the second was his former son-in-law. And I don't know what you're thinking as I'm saying this, but I'm thinking, how on earth could a man called to ministry, whose job it is to mirror the love and the kindness of God, develop a grudge so deep that he would take measures not only to injure someone, but to murder them? How far gone in his soul does someone have to be to get to this point? And does that story and stories more recent about abuse, about adultery, about deceit, about financial indiscretion among church leaders. How do all of those stories reflect Jesus and the gospel to a watching world? How will stories like that reflect on the already tarnished reputation of ministers who were once regarded as the most trustworthy profession in our society, but whose trustworthiness is now at an all-time low? I remember my grandfather, who was a preacher, telling me that he could go to just about any golf course and play for free because of the fact that he simply was a preacher. It was the preacher discount. I don't know of any discounts like that anymore. Mark, any discounts that you get? Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Yeah, it's changed. In 2018, Christianity Today published the results of a Gallup poll that surveyed Americans' feelings of trustworthiness among some common professions in our society. And this poll found that ministers are seen as less trustworthy than judges, daycare providers, police officers, pharmacists, medical doctors, grade school teachers, military officers, and nurses. Simply put, national stories like that tarnish the reputation of preachers, of churches, and church members. And then I thought about Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount when he said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that who, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. For obvious reasons, it's, it's easy for us to be appalled when we hear that a preacher would seek out the services of a hitman. But are we also appalled when character assassination through gossip and slander occurs in churches 
in restaurants, in living rooms, and on the internet. While one certainly has more far-reaching consequences than the other, in God's eyes, both seeking out a partner in gossip and seeking out a hitman comes from similar roots. I'm not diminishing the seriousness of hiring a hitman, but rather to draw attention to the fact that resentful seeds can reside in every human heart. These seeds can grow and they can become evil desires to hunt or to take down another. A few weeks ago, we talked about two different forms of anger, life-giving and life-taking, righteous anger and unrighteous anger. But that raises a question. What keeps our anger life-giving or righteous? Well, there is a practice that is cultivated in cooperation with the Holy Spirit that can help us do so, while also embodying and advancing the gentleness of Jesus Christ in our dealings with others who have injured us. And this specific form of heart work is an essential prerequisite to all forms of healthy life-giving anger. Without it, the kind of gentleness that turns away wrath simply cannot exist. Christian discipleship gets derailed without it because its absence negates what Scripture calls the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A ministry that God does through us for the purpose of demolishing dividing walls of enmity and strife. So what is this specific practice that is such an essential component of healthy conflict and reconciliation? It's the virtue and the practice of maintaining a forgiving posture, enabling us to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. A couple of years ago, the Barna Group, a group that we've referenced before who does a lot of study and research into Christians, they did a survey of some American Christians' experience with giving and also receiving forgiveness. And I found the results very interesting because it shows that a large portion of Christians struggle with giving forgiveness and also struggle with receiving forgiveness. And many, as you'll see in just a moment, felt like they have never received unconditional forgiveness. So this is practicing Christians' forgiveness experiences. Three and four thought that that they have offered unconditional forgiveness to someone else. About half said that they had received unconditional forgiveness. A little less than that, they had not received unconditional forgiveness. Just a little over one in four said that they have identified someone they don't want to forgive. A little less than that, someone that they can't forgive. And a few others struggled to receive forgiveness for something, and even a smaller portion have not offered unconditional forgiveness. One in four practicing Christians, according to this survey, struggle to forgive someone. The vice president of of this Barna group, her name was Brooke Hempel, she said this, forgiveness is central to Christianity. It's what distinguishes it from any other religious faith. We are reconciled to God through Jesus' sacrifice, and in response, We should be agents of reconciliation in every aspect of our lives. If Christians struggle to extend or receive forgiveness, not only do their relationships suffer, the church's witness is marred. Let's take a look at forgiveness. When talking about forgiving someone, I think this is essential for us to understand. It is costly. Offering forgiveness is costly. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then he continued. He said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Clearly, Forgiveness is a foundational and very significant part of our relationship with God. 
But when this verse is separated from its broader context, it sounds like Jesus is saying that there is this cause and effect relationship between our forgiveness of others and God's willingness to forgive us. What a disorienting thought that God's forgiveness of me is based on my ability to forgive others. However, the broader context of Jesus' words and New Testament teachings, when you look at that broader context, it's clear that that kind of conclusion is unwarranted. Salvation, which includes receiving and extending God's forgiveness, is by grace through faith in Christ alone. It is not based upon works of any kind, including the works of forgiving others. Only the work of Jesus is able to save us. So Jesus is not saying that the Father's saving grace is given as a result of one's works of forgiveness. However, Jesus is saying that if we prefer our grudges over pursuing reconciliation, either we are stunted in our Christian growth or we might not be Christian at all. So we need to ask ourselves these questions. Do we prefer to remain at odds with an enemy versus doing the work of making peace with them? Do we prefer to resent and retaliate instead of forgiving those who have injured us? Is being, more, is being vindictive more appealing to us than being merciful and kind? Have we become the kinds of people for who resentment feels justified and a gentle answer feels insufficient. Before we keep going, I just want to ask this question. Why is forgiving difficult? There's no question that it is such a foundational part of our relationship with God, our relationship with our brothers and sisters, and our relationship with people in the whole world. Why is it so hard? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, we were talking about this with the kids, and one of the kids mentioned that sometimes it's hard when you just have so many visual reminders of, of what hurt you. Right? Yeah. So, for instance, if, if it's someone you don't see every day, <clears throat> maybe have an easier time with that as opposed to someone you do see it. So, for, so the difficulty might be depending on how close that person might be to your life? For, yeah, yeah, reminders of the herd and opportunities to rehash it in our minds and then okay. we go backward in our spirit instead of forward with Christ. Okay, yes? I think that our heart just isn't right and we have to work on that. Our heart just isn't right. We have to get our heart right. Absolutely. It is, it's totally a heart issue, um, and it is costly, and it is very difficult, and it requires sacrifice. What else? Yeah, Casey? Some people may think, well, I don't think they're really sorry for what they did, you know, and even though somebody might say sorry, you, you still have that thing inside you that's like, yeah, wasn't it wasn't a true apology? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think we just sometimes want to make them know how hurt we are. We want to hurt back or something. So yeah. it's just we're hurt and we want them to know it mm -hmm. and feel it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a great point. I I definitely feel that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. That is not a modern issue for us. I mean, we can read all through the Bible. And I was reading Luke earlier. Uh, you know, how many times should I forgive? He said seven times and then seven times more. Uh, we see Peter asking a similar question. So it, it's, it's part of our inherent insides, I think, that it, it's tough. Because if I, if I forgive you, then you think, well, that's not that big a deal sometimes. To me, it was huge. To you, it wasn't that big a deal. You do it again. Then, yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to forgive you again? Yes, 70 times. 
No. That's not right. Jeremy? I think we do want to feel like we're in control. I'm not saying that's right, but that we even have control. But if, if we offer forgiveness, then maybe we, we feel like we've lost that, that control over mm -hmm. that person. No, you're absolutely right. When, when you forgive, you're saying, I'm going to let God you know, deal with any punishment that he deems would be necessary. That's difficult to give up. Yeah. One Christian author and therapist said this about forgiveness, and I, I thought it was so good. We have to ponder to search our hearts about why we cannot forgive. The labor of such a search means we may be in for the wild ride of facing our hidden demands, concealed wounds, and camouflaged pettiness. The discovery of our self-righteousness may be a nightmare. It might expose a cruel, miserly, Scrooge-like heart. Forgiving love is the inconceivable, unexplainable pursuit of the offender by the offended for the sake of restored relationship with God, self, and others. I will not be able to love unless I forgive, and I will not forgive unless my hatred is continually melted by the searing truth and grace of the gospel. True biblical forgiveness is a glorious gift for both the offender and the offended. If we could just read that about 20 more times... <laughs> and try to soak all of that in because I think that is so good and it, it really fits in so well with what we're, we're talking about. One line that really struck a chord with me in that is, forgiving love is the inconceivable, unexplainable pursuit of the offender by the offended. Doesn't that so accurately describe the forgiving love of Jesus? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Is there anything in that that, that stood out to you before we move on? So, Larry mentioned Peter. Let's talk about Peter. After hearing Jesus teach about pursuing reconciliation and forgiveness, Peter asks him a clarifying question in Matthew chapter 18. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Before we condemn Peter for being stingy in the application of grace toward others. And before we conclude that, well, Peter just lacks gentleness, Peter lacks mercy, this is just classic Peter, we need to pause and, and we should first consider the limits of our own patience toward repeat offenses and offenders. How often have we been willing to forgive others, even for small offenses? And if that consideration isn't enough to have some sympathy for Peter's response, maybe we should better understand the Jewish teaching and expectations of Peter's day. Peter was familiar with the teaching that said, if a person sinned against you once or twice, you must forgive them. After the third time, forgiveness was no longer required. So in comparison to this norm, Peter was saying that he would be all in, even if the Lord wanted him to more than double the rabbi's standard of that day. Peter was willing to do that. He was willing to go far above and beyond what even the rabbis commanded concerning forgiveness because of his love and loyalty to Jesus. Peter knew Jesus was all about raising the bar, setting a higher standard. And he figured maybe more than doubling the amount of forgiveness. That would be where Jesus' standard was. But Jesus' answer to Peter was surprising because Peter thought, okay, this is the highest level, seven times, that's got to be it. And Jesus said, how about 77 times or 70 times seven? And that phrase is, is an idiom. We're not supposed to look into the math of that. He's just representing an infinite number an infinite number of times that you should forgive someone. Peter's willingness to forgive more than twice the standard of that day still fell short of what Jesus said was God's standard. According to Jesus, if we want to be his disciples, then we cannot place any limits on the number of times that we are willing to forgive those who offend, forgive those who insult, who injure, who persecute and betray us. And this includes 
Smaller offenses, such as a driver cutting us off in traffic, a server giving us the wrong food at the restaurant, someone criticizing our political views. But this also includes the greater offenses, the ones that feel like our skin is being ripped from us or our soul or our spirit is being crushed. Forgiving others as God in Christ has forgiven us is gutsy and gut-wrenching. It's courageous and terrifying. It's redemptive and it's messy. It's breathtaking and very exhausting. The practice of forgiveness is absolutely not easy. Let's take a look at forgiveness in the Bible and specifically what I think might be examples of what that 70 times 7 forgiveness really looks like. In the Old Testament, we're told about Joseph who was betrayed, sold into slavery by his older brothers. And years later, when they were finally called on to face him, Joseph confronted them and he said this to them, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring, about, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. We're also told about Isaiah, whose preaching was denounced, scorned by every person in Israel, including those who would execute him by sawing him in two. And this is what he said. Instead of resenting and retaliating against those who rejected him, Isaiah offered assurances such as, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Those, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And then also this in chapter 62 and verse 5. As a young man marries a young woman, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. In the New Testament, we're told about Stephen, who prayed for his killers as they were hurling flesh-piercing, skull-crushing rocks at his head. This is what came out of his mouth. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Do not hold this sin against them. <clears throat> That's incredible forgiveness. There is something remarkable about the extent to which people are willing to forgive after they themselves have tasted God's forgiveness towards them. On the flip side of this equation, we also see in Scripture examples of what not forgiving looks like. We see what that looks like in the first four chapters of Jonah. God gave Jonah such a challenging, significant task that I think is really hard for us as Americans in the 21st century to really understand why that was so difficult for Jonah, why that would be so hard for him. The task God gave to him to preach God's love to the people of Nineveh in hopes that the whole city, including their tyrannical king, would listen, would be humbled, would repent, and be saved. For years, a serious capital city, city, Nineveh, had been known, had only been known by Jonah and his fellow Jews as a oppressive, as abusive, and as violent. A serious scorched earth expansion through military force, through torture, through rape, through enslavement had brutally and systematically wrecked many lives and communities. So Jonah the prophet, he had zero interest in dealing with those people. He had zero interest in being a part of God's rescue mission to this evil and to this undeserving city. His only interest toward Nineveh was resentment, was hatred, was scorn, and if the opportunity presented itself, retaliation and revenge toward violent and inhumane people. In essence, Jonah's attitude was forgive and preach grace to them? You've got to be kidding me. C.S. Lewis once said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Jonah had no desire to forgive Nineveh or to see them forgiven. Instead, he wanted to see them utterly and mercilessly destroyed. 
But what do we see and what do we learn at the end of that story? We learn that Jonah's resentful grudge toward Nineveh ended up injuring him much more than it injured them. It caused him to become fixated on his own resentment and victimhood, proving that the true prisoner of a grudge is not the one against whom it is held, but the one who does the holding. It's kind of like a poisonous berry. Vindictiveness, it tastes sweet, it might swallow smoothly at first, but then once it gets inside of you, it starts working less like fruit and more like cyanide. To survive it, we've got to get it out of our system. The reality is this. It costs us dearly to forgive someone. It costs us even more not to forgive someone. To extend forgiving grace involves truth-telling and maintaining a non-retaliatory posture. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. As we extend the forgiveness that Christ has secured for us, we open our hearts to the possibility, even to the hope, that the offending party would someday soften and experience sorrow for the hurt that he or she has caused. We also hold out hope that the perpetrator would confess his wrongdoing and and seek forgiveness from God and from us. Our forgiveness includes the ongoing choice of exchanging our daydreams of our enemy's demise for new daydreams, ones in which he or she is humbled into repentance and begins a right relationship with God. For the last part of class, we're going to talk a little bit about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. But before we do, I just want to ask you, when you are presented with an opportunity to forgive someone, how, do you, how does that work out in your mind? What is forgiveness to you? Define that in your own words. What would you say? It is hard. <laughs> Absolutely, it's hard. Yes? Well, I think maybe you should go to the person and tell them that you had hard feelings because of what happened and tell them that you don't want to hold a grudge and you want you, you forgive them for anything that they might have done or ask them to forgive you for the thoughts that you've had against them. That's a great point. Yep. I mean, part of forgiving is, is just action. It's kind of hard to define it when part of forgiving is literally going and, and doing something like that. Great thought. Yes? I'm a numbers guy, so for me, it's to make it whole again. Okay. Um, that's kind of what it works out in my mind, is that there's a perceived imbalance, yeah. and by accepting the forgiveness, I am, that's being made whole again. It's a great thought. I like that. Mark? I like what you said earlier. I keep going back to the word you used, posture. I, I like the idea of a forgiving posture. Mm-hmm. And what it really boils down to is, is being content and, de- and deciding to act like God in the matter. Right? Because there, there, are, there are layers of it that can't get better until the other person is genuinely sorry. Right? Just as right. with God. There cannot be true reconciliation until there's repentance on their part. Nonetheless, we choose willingly, unconditionally, to have a forgiving posture. And and that seems to be the focus of much of the the teaching of the text, right? That's the part we can control. Mm -hmm. And and a very hard part to control, but uh, that's that's where we really have to win the battle, decide to be Christ-like. Yeah. To, to reflect, one way to say it is to reflect, to act like God in reflecting his, his, his grace and his mercy and just his, as you said, his posture, you know, for the purpose of bringing about mm-hmm. the repentance and the, and the ultimate reconciliation. 
And that's why God initiated, he reached out to us first before we reached out to him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Yeah, Casey? I always like to think the best of someone. And so if you're thick-skinned or thin-skinned, that can play a big part in how you might think that you were slighted or been offended on something. And, you know, little things happen all the time. You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic that you mentioned or bumps your car at the grocery store or whatever. There's just a myriad of things. But you, if you just don't think that they meant any malice towards you or something to that extent, you know, or even things that families say, you know, if you want to get more personal or, or things like that, it's like, you know, they're probably just having a bad day. You know, it's, it's, it starts with your whole attitude. And like I said, I like to always think the best of somebody until they really prove it wrong. And, you know, then you've got something that you can deal with. Absolutely. Yeah, John? Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to say it, but I, like, I mean, with forgiveness to me, it's also, there's a finality to it. That particular situation doesn't mean you don't stop hurting, right? You don't still feel that, but you, you know, there, there, there needs to be some that's akin to that situation in a way between you and the other person. It's like the imbalance that was spoken about. And so I was thinking about sometimes how we portray that, or I may betray that, is if I say, I forgive you, but, you know, keep going on, make sure that, you know, that just, it should be just I forgive you, or, you know, as a thing, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's not, I'll forgive you, and here's the list of demands I want yeah, you to meet. Yeah. And it's right. the same thing of saying you're sorry, right? It's not sorry, but, you know, but it, it's, it's kind of finality to it. There's no strings attached to go on beyond that. You hope, and like you would hear when Peter asked him, Christ gives him, doesn't matter how many times, if somebody keeps sinning against you the same way, you still forgive them. That's, mm -hmm. There's kind of a finality, you know, there's a finality. Right. Great comment. I think one thing to think about is forgiveness is not acting like a doormat. Forgiving others for insult and injury does not require us to be doormats. It is not letting the offending party off the hook. It is not withholding accountability or the appropriate expressions of anger toward the offender. We are not called to be passive or to allow ourselves to be taken advantage of. In fact, Scripture forbids that we act as doormats when it instructs, be angry and do not sin. While we may want to humbly extend grace, Christians might misunderstand and misapply Jesus' teaching on non-retaliation. We won't take the time to turn there, but I'll just quickly read this. Matthew 5, 38. He says, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the, the one who is evil. But if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. A misreading of this text might lead an abused spouse to conclude that she should keep taking the abuse. Or that a falsely accused inmate should not talk to an attorney to plead his case or that a bullied student should keep being bullied instead of standing up for himself or herself. As humans and as Christians, the Lord did not intend for us to be passive in situations like that. There is a healthy, a righteous kind of anger and a healthy response that goes along with forgiveness and with a gentle answer. So when we are targets and victims, and victims of someone else's sin, we must find healthy ways to make it difficult for others to continue sinning against us. So that's the first thing. Forgiveness is not acting like a doormat. And secondly, forgiveness is not automatic trust. Forgiving those who have injured us is not easy work, and it is not for the faint of heart. And depending on the degree of injury, the process can be excruciating. Even when sorrow has been expressed by the offending party, it may take the person or persons who are injured a significant amount of time to regain trust. Forgiveness is not automatic trust. Third, forgiveness is canceling the offender's debt. In the parable of the unmerciful servant, we see exactly what it means to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. Let's turn there. Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. 
Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus answered him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not, have you, have had, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So we too are faced with a choice to exercise vengeance or mercy. And finally, forgiveness is compelled by pity. When the servant begged the king for mercy in Matthew 18, the king canceled his insurmountable debt and let him go. The reason he did this is the same reason God cancels our debt and lets us go. Matthew 18 and verse 27, he did so out of pity for him. To pity an offender is to discern the truth that beneath every sin and every offense there is also a wound. In scripture, God demonstrates immense love and patience and forgiveness to serious offenders, including leaders with a temper like Moses, weak husbands like Abraham, unfair fathers like Isaac, liars like Jacob, prostitutes like Gomer and Rahab, adulterer and murderers and abusers of power like David, womanizers like Solomon, big mouths like Peter, crooks like Zacchaeus, and the list goes on. It helps to be reminded that in this tired world, filled with sin and all of sin's collateral pain, it is hurting people who tend to do the most hurting of others. It is a vicious cycle that can only be broken through the grace of God and by the power of Jesus Christ. And while these factors, while they don't excuse a person for causing pain to others, they are nonetheless a very, very helpful reminder that beneath most distorted human behaviors are wounds that influence it, wounds that can heal when met with a gentle answer from Christ and from his people, as opposed to bitter, retaliatory responses. Nowhere in scripture does it say that it is repentance that causes God to be kind. On the contrary, scripture insists that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repent. We can look again to the parable of the unmerciful servant for the reasons and motives that make forgiveness possible. The king in this parable initially cracks down on his servant, a man who owes him 10,000 talents or in our money around six billion dollars. And even though the king knew that this servant would never be able to repay that, he let him go. And this servant finds someone who owes in our in today's money, about $12,000 and demands payment. Here's the final thought I want to leave you with. The cross reveals both our debt and our value. No one deserves forgiveness. While we were still sinners is precisely when Christ died for us. The cross not only reveals the gravity of our debt, it reveals the greater gravity of God's unfailing love for us. How do we know the value of a work of art? 
How do we recognize its true worth? Well, a work of art is worth what the highest bidder is willing to pay for it. Jesus dying on the cross became God's statement of your value in Christ. And what he was willing to give up in order to redeem, restore, and retain you and I forever as his child. So let's all forgive others as God in Christ has also forgiven us. Thank you so much for listening. And just a, a few minutes, uh, why it's going to come, lead us in a couple of songs, and then I'll uh, dismiss us in a closing prayer. Good evening. I'll be leading two songs before the dismissal this evening. Our first song will be Wonderful Story of Love. Sing all three verses. Mm. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful. Wonderful story of love, though you are far away. Wonderful story of love, still he does call today. Calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation. Wonderful story of love, song before the prayer this evening will be uh, Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims, number 213. Our 
hearts within us say, Yonder over the lonely river where shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed give gladdens all our longing eyes. Here souls are often weariful on the pilgrims lurking full, but the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know yonder been so good to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Wyatt, for leading us in those songs. And I hope that everyone's Bible class was really beneficial for them and that we'll all be able to go back to our homes tonight and think about what we've talked about and, and try and look for ways we can improve our hearts and, and become more like Jesus. Thank you for joining us online. Um, we'll now end with a closing prayer. God, we come before you just so thankful that we could be here this evening to open up our Bibles and to study your word and to sing just a couple of songs. And we're just so thankful for all the many blessings and all the love that you give us and you show us and you show us every day. Help us to go out the rest of this week and to show your son more in our lives to this world that needs it so badly. In Jesus' name, amen.